Thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is John Riley. I'm an assistant Gen general counsel at the Copyright Office. Uh, this panel is going to discuss perspectives on the most effective ways to communicate to creators regarding the MLC and claiming unclaimed royalties. I'm very excited uh, to have you all here on this panel today. Um, as with the other panels, we're going to do a very brief uh, introduction of where everyone's from. And uh, if you want more information, these bios are in the back of our program today. So on my left is Mark Eisenberg. Uh, he's the Senior Vice President and Head of Global Content Partnerships at SoundCloud. To his left is Dave Bogan. Dave is the founder of Tune Registry, which was purchased by the music payment and workflow management company Jamber. And he currently serves as a Senior Vice President of Global Music Rights there. Linda Blossbaum is the Senior Director for Artists and Industry Relations at SoundExchange. On her left is Todd Dupler. Todd is the Senior Director of Advocacy and Public Policy for the Recording Academy. Next to Todd is Kevin Erickson, the Director of the Fu Future of Music Coalition. Kimberly Tigner is the Executive Director for the Institute of Intellectual Property and Social Justice and is the founder of Take Creative Control. At the end of our uh, days here is Jennifer Turnbow, the Senior Director of Operations for the National Songwriter Association International, or NSAI. NSAI is the non-voting member of the MLC board representing a nationally recognized nonprofit trade association whose primary mission is advocacy on behalf of songwriters in the United States. Thank you all for being here today. All right, so for those of us who are here earlier, um, I want to start us off. David Hughes said earlier today that the further you get from the source, the less likely the data is accurate. So let's talk a little bit more about uh, reaching out to the source, the creators themselves. I think uh, I want Mark to start us off here and maybe add on as he, after he answers, but um, I'm curious as to what, what are some misconceptions you hear from independent musicians with respect to copyright credits and being paid? What don't they understand? Uh, well, let me take a step back and talk about the SoundCloud community, uh, creator community generally. Um, we serve as a community that's about over 20 million in, uh, in size. Um, and out of those 20, 20 million creators, uh, about 10 million creators get heard every month. So it's a really long tail, but there, there are plays for millions and millions of bedroom creators every month. Um, and our community really uh, uh, transcends from the bedroom creator to the hobbyist to the established superstar. So the established superstar will typically have an administrator or a publishing company representing them, and they don't have to do anything except create. But the, the DIY creator, that is the responsibility of the DIY, the DIY creator to really metadata, metadata tag his or her uh, songs, uh, recordings and to get the information into the system so that ultimately they can get paid. And the information is, is pretty lacking out there as to what the identifiers are, where to even put the, 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 the information, how to claim it after the fact if they forgot to put it in or didn't know the information at the time it was, was uh, uploaded to the site. So th from an educational standpoint, I think it's incumbent upon all of us as services and as an industry to really get to the artist community to explain exactly what the nature of copyright is, because they don't. Some of the creators don't actually understand the difference between a musical work and a sound recording copyright, let alone per public performance and mechanical, let alone international versus U.S. So it's just a myriad of of, of, of sort of this this cloud that they don't really understand. And as as a as a as a, uh, a service to the community, I think we all need both as institutions and, and as uh, businesses to really allow them to understand the, the process better. You said that you had uh, kind of the DIY creators as well as kind of the more experienced musicians on your service, which is great. Uh, what do you think, is, is there a point as they you know, become more established where there is a learning curve for them? Um, do they know very little or nothing? And do they get that information as they kind of progress in their careers or? Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's, it's really that they become more business savvy as they become a business person. So people initially start as a creator because it's either a hobby or a passion or just a love. And then ultimately music can turn into a business. And it doesn't have to be a, a mega you know, hit. It doesn't have, you know, we, we've you know, created little, little, little Tekka, little Nas X, you know, a Post Malone, Billie Eilish, they've all started on SoundCloud and maybe they had dreams of becoming who they are today, but probably not. Probably they just wanted to make music. So they weren't thinking about, you know, 
uh, ISWCs and IPIs and ISRCs at the time they were creating or honing their craft. But as the, 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 their, 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 uh, the craft matured, then all of a sudden they had to go back and figure out, well, how do I actually monetize this or put the metadata together so that I can ultimately claim my, 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 my value. So let me ask Todd, you know, you've talked to a lot of creators. Anyone who's been on the internet sees, you know, on YouTube, no copyright intended, right? Um, there's a lot of misconceptions out there. You know, is there, in your experience, kind of a, a spectrum or different pockets of communities who have more or less information on kind of copyright and credits um, or more? Sure, absolutely. I, th I think there is a spectrum of, um, you know, especially for many of us that work with membership organizations, there are people that lean in and, and want to get really engaged and involved. And then there's people that have never been exposed to a lot of this information. And I think what we've discovered is that as people start to learn a little bit, uh, when they get this deep, then they want to go this deep and they want to learn more and more once they get that first taste of, because information is power. I think when people, the more artists know about their rights, the more they feel empowered um, to stick up for themselves and protect their rights. And so I think uh, one of the things that's been talked about a lot throughout the day is that um, the more information that songwriters have uh, and the easier we make it for them to act on that information, um, the more successful this project is going to be. Um, I know, and Ivan did such a great job of um, talking about this earlier, but our producers and engineers wing at the Recording Academy, which is made up specifically of, of the studio professionals and our membership, thousands of producers, engineers, and, and audio professionals, have thought for years about the issue of credits and metadata and making sure there is accurate uh, credits for a host of reasons. The, the first is making sure all the creative participants or paid properly, but it, it goes beyond that. I mean, we think credits is good for consumers and music fans to be able to learn more about their favorite music. We think, um, you know, from an Academy perspective, if you want to be a, a member or if you want to be eligible to be nominated for an award, you, your credits have to be uh, reliable on that track as well. And so, um, you know, they've worked very hard to establish best practices for collecting data because, again, as has been discussed, getting it at the source of creation is going to be the best time to collect that data. And so equipping producers and engineers in the studio to collect data, to submit it with the track when it's finished, so all of that is there at the beginning. Uh, it's something that our PE wing has been um, working on as a long-term project. Uh, they've created you know, a, a, um, a guideline for the kind of data that producers should be working to collect. Um, that informed um, DDEX as they were developing the RIN uh, standard. Uh, the Recording Academy is a member of DDEX, and I think we're the only participant, uh, only member of DDEX that does represent that full creative spectrum of actual creators. And I know um, many of people here are probably know Maureen Droney, who's the director of our p and &E wing, has been um, very active in the DDEX community working on these issues on behalf of our producers and engineers. So. Is there a way to kind of quantify how many people in the DIY uh, groups out there who know what a RIN is? You know, is, is that something that's true? I mean, anywhere. No, I mean, I, I think, um, like I said, there's there's tiers of people. I, I think the the studio professionals, the guys that are that deal with the the tech, that are the producers and engineers. I think it's more common there. But I think right, if you the, the, the everyday songwriter and, and artist probably doesn't. I think that's fair. Well, um, let me ask Kevin then, because I know that Future Music does a lot of uh, educational outreach, and a couple things I wanted you to kind of uh, tell us about. One is, um, I noticed on your website, you have a lot of uh, quizzes for uh, the community to see how much they know about, uh, in, in essence, music and copyright. And another thing is, I want you to tell us about kind of your experience during the MMA, um, talking to not only creators, but to members of Congress and their staff and educating them about kind of the differences between sound recording music works and the rest. Oh, you want me to talk about the puppets? I want you to talk about the puppets. Yeah. <laughs> so I see. I, I did do a puppet show. I think it was for an internet caucus event. But yeah, it's the, the, um, um, the, the process of explaining the, the music licensing system uh, became so repetitive. And, and there were so many congressional staffers that were just like, can you explain it to me like I'm five, that I eventually just 
got on eBay and bought some puppets, hand, some hand puppets, and a little, this is Sally the songwriter, and this is Ricky the recording artist, and they're different people, and they partner with the record, and it worked. Um, it might be a little bit juvenile for explaining that stuff to artists, but Congress needs a different... <laughs> No, it's, it's just because they have so much, the staffers are bombarded with so much information and they need to be, to be able to capture it quickly and visually. But um, you need to experiment. You need to play with a bunch of different kinds of methods of uh, information communication because different people have different learning styles, different artists have different vocabularies, different communities have different standards of how they transmit in information and they participate in different kinds of communities. And, and so... Uh, to be able to effectively communicate to the artist uh, population, you have to be able to speak in a multitude of voices. And so it can't just be one organization. It's got to be a whole bunch of different organizations working together in tandem. Well, I, I think on your left, we got a couple of those organizations right now. Um, I want to kind of get a little bit of the two of your experiences um, because there seems to be an understanding that the Nashville community is relatively very well educated on music, uh, music policy, and frankly, the law. Um, can you tell me like a, a little bit about your understanding of why that might be? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think that's true to an extent. Nashville's kind of a unicorn in the music industry because really most of the commerce of music from writing the song to pitching it to the artist, to the record label, doing what they do with it and the producer being involved and actually going in and, you know, cutting the record all really happens on about three streets in Nashville. And so, <clears throat> and Nashville's really a community um, where, you know, I spent some time in LA and there are times that I drive an hour and a half from, you know, one music industry company to another. Um, and so I think there's just less opportunity in other cities and other communities <clears throat> for all of these different elements of the creative process to come together and be talking about issues like this. Um, Nashville's just kind of unique in that way. But I also think that, you know, the the publishers and the record labels have also really encouraged their their writers and their artists to get more involved in that and and to not you know just you know rely on on them to do everything so and so i is there anything about you know, I know Nashville has more than just country music, of course, but is there anything about country music? I Maybe it has less samples or, uh, you know, fewer writers we heard before. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's several writers on some pop tracks, for example. Uh, is there anything about the community other than the physical, physical proximity? Yeah, I mean, I, I think for the most part, everybody knows everybody. So, I mean, that's part of it, you know? I mean... It, if you even if you only wrote with this guy the one time that you made this one song, like you know him and everybody you know knows him. So it, it's not like, you know, they get sort of this other writer gets sort of lost in the ether. Plus, there's a lot fewer writers. I mean, it's pretty unusual for more than four writers to be on a on a country song. So, so you know, understanding that, though, is there anything that we can take away from kind of the strength of of all of that you've said from Nashville and kind of broadcast it across the country as we educate other creators, because it sounds like it's a very tight knit community, um, but that might be hard to replicate. Are there any lessons learned that, from Nashville that we could? Yeah, I mean, I think that is hard to replicate, but I do think that, you know, it's important to talk about that, you know, writers have to be concerned about more than just the creative process in the writing room, you know, you've, you do have to get each other's information and know what the split is on the song before you walk out the door. Um, because that stuff gets lost really, really quickly if it's not understood ahead of time and written down in some cases. Um, and so I think that is probably the biggest thing that I would, that I would take away from, from Nashville is, you know, however it is that you're writing it, you know, get all of that out clear to start with, because I feel like that's where a lot of the holdup comes in. I think one thing, King, on that too, I think the word community that you said is a real key one. And I think 
you know, one of the strengths of Nashville is that it's a community. And so I think finding where there's that sense of community exists across the music spectrum. So, you know, whether you're a member of the Recording Academy, you're a member of NSAI, you're a member, uh, you work with FMC or, or any of the other artist organizations, those are communities that exist in those contexts as well. And I think that provides a platform for us to do the kind of education and outreach um, that's necessary for this to succeed. Well, that's a good lead into a question for Kim. Um, you know, you've done a lot of work to empower historically disadvantaged and excluded groups. You know, what would your messaging be to these groups and with respect to getting the works identified and matched in the MLC's database? I mean, I think, so I feel like you started to touch on it, right? The idea of community and the idea when you were asking specifically, you know, what's happening in Nashville, we approach it with, you know, treating each activation that we do in different cities. We find creative centers, but we understand that the creative community, they each have their own flow. They each have their own rhythm. And there's different ways to kind of communicate a same message to them in a way that will resonate with them. I think that as far as, you know, I have to tell you, my, my background is uh, civil rights. I come from a um, large traditional civil rights organization prior to joining um, the intellectual property community. Um, in my current think tank. And so when we think about outreach and when we think about organizing, we really do, I mean, the first premise is, you know, the folks that we're trying to touch, who is the most vulnerable? Who is it that's going to be the most difficult? Let's put that at the center, right? And then everybody else will get touched, you know? And what we're seeing, and I feel like this is the theme that's been going on all day today, right? This, it, we've been touching at it. Vicki, I think you almost, we, we started to hear about it. We're, we're seeing this influx of diverse creators coming in, right? But then we have to think about the different ways to touch these diverse creators, right? They, uh, where do they live? Where do they create? How do they create? And who are they listening to, right? And then figuring out who those folks are and bringing them in in the beginning, right? Not this, I think we all have a, in DC, I'm gonna own it, I'm DC. Um, we have this habit of creating a, a formula for doing something. And then we just kind of retrofit everyone into that everywhere we go, right? But the most powerful way and the most effective way to outreach and bring folks in is to bring those, I call them village elders, but a lot of them are not elders, but it's the folks that people are listening to, right? Bring them in, have them have their input baked in from the beginning as to how you build these brain trusts and these activations and talk about these issues in a way that very much um, resonate with them. And in terms of the different communities, are there anything, you know, I, I appreciate what you're saying that there's kind of a lot of differences in terms of being an effective communicators. I think we try to look to kind of commonalities so we can make things efficient. Um, are there any good lessons learned that we from different groups, whether they're different genres, different regions, different um, kind of parts of these communities that kind of are, are commonalities? I would say that one commonality that we found is that in a lot of these communities, you know, I'm going to go back again to my village elder, but basically the folks who are, you know, have been the most fantastic partners. And we were just talking about one um, colleague that we have in, in common, um, who's a friend of mine, who basically are, they can beautifully bridge both the creative and the more policy or administrative discussions. Um, you know, as far as the most successful partnerships that we've built in like local or, you know, in the beginning, it would be um, a lot of producers, a lot of managers, DJs, folks that are those creative entrepreneurs um, that are ready and, and have a real appetite for these conversations. Um, and that can really point out things. I will fully own that law school basically pounced and pounded the last bit of creative juice I have in me. Yeah. So I just have to spend the rest of my life being happy, supporting and, and lifting up the creatives because I just don't have it in me, but I love it. Um, but it's to say that there's just a lot of blind spots, a lot of things that I don't see. And, you know, even, you know, I was listening to the panel before us and I... They were, it was clear that the intent to try to build a system and an interface that was very easy for folks to work with, and, and, I, and, I, and I know that's where everybody's going and that's where they're headed, but to me, I'm thinking, okay, well, I take for granted often what is very easy for me may not necessarily be 
easy for someone else who uses a totally different side of their brain than I do. And and so for me to try to talk about issues in a way that um, is comfortable for me may not resonate with another with with someone who's more creative. Um, so just constantly keeping that in mind and really leaning on the talents of folks that can that very quickly can identify those blind spots and just say, you know, no, that 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 is not that's going to go right here. Let's get this conversation down here. I agree with all of that. I do want to mention, though, make no mistake that creating communities with the folks that we need to reach the worst in this process will be Herculean, mostly because these are the folks that feel like the traditional music system has failed them. And they take a lot of pride in being independent and not being joiners. And so grabbing them and making them a joiner in a community and making, you know, trying to create trust with them is a Herculean effort. Yeah, I think we'll talk a little bit more about trust in a second, but that's a very important point. I don't want to go too far without talking today um, because I, I think, you know, Tune Registry is an important all-in-one mu music and rights metadata management platform that was creative to kind of serve some of these issues. Uh, maybe could you tell us a little bit about kind of the gap that you're that your uh, business was created to fill and how you can convince those DIY songwriters that they need to effectively manage their metadata? Um, actually, this really good piggyback off what you were just saying, <laughs> uh, independent artists who want to uh, remain independent um, and feel that they have some participation in the kind of the music ecosystem without giving up their rights or without giving away a chunk of their potential royalties until they feel that they're in a place um, where they want to do that. So with Tune Registry, um, you know, Tune Registry kind of came about after I was managing independent artists and um, working with artists who would collaborate and do co-writes on, on, on with uh, established songwriters who had publishers and, 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 and these you know, co-writers did not have publishers, but also weren't, were not ready to get a publishing deal either. They didn't want to yet or, or just simply weren't going to get signed. Um, so you kind of have, you know, we have this long tail that everyone's familiar with, which are kind of the DIY artists and, um, uh, you know, that are, that are releasing music, uh, but they tend to be uh, underserved uh, in a lot of ways. Um, and a lot of that comes from access to uh, the tools and resources to properly administer their catalogs. Um, so, we, so I built Tune Registry as this easy to use, very affordable, um, kind of low entry point way of making sure that, you know, if you write a song in your, you know, your bedroom and you're gonna put it up on SoundCloud or use a, a distro kit and put it up on Spotify, um, that you can still make sure you're collecting your mechanical royalties and your performance royalties without getting a publisher who's gonna do that for you. Um, and as artists are becoming more aware, I think one thing I've heard a few times throughout the, the, the symposium, and, and I kind of just hear in general, is um, that there's not information out there and people are confused. But the reality is, I mean, there's a ton of information out there. I mean, Future Music Coalition, uh, myself, I, you know, I put out content, I wrote an ebook for Creative Future, which a lot of artists who've come to us said, oh, I've you know, got this ebook. I've learned about the difference between a song and a recording and the splits, and therefore now I want to be more active. Um, so there's a lot of uh, information out there. There's a, a, a ton of great bloggers who uh, put out art, you know, posts every single week about the music industry. Um, but what, where I saw the, the gap was really in the tools. And it, it was mentioned uh, maybe on the last panel in regards to kind of the cost of the tools. Like if you're an independent songwriter, um, if you're Lil Nas X, right, and uh, you get a hit um, and you don't have a major publisher, I mean, you're not going to go buy a $20,000, you know, administration software to administer that one song. But at the same time, you still need to administer that song because it's going to generate $20,000 $20, in performance and mechanical royalties. Um, so, uh, you know, there, there was kind of this, this huge gap between Okay, there's a long tail, and the catalog isn't really generating a lot of revenue from an individual song standpoint. Um, and then you have the one percent, the, the, the one to ninety-nine I heard earlier from Bill, um, and the one percent that is generating the revenue, and therefore the teams around those copyrights can afford the the expensive software and, and the relationships and the industry relations people to go out and, and maintain those relationships. But what about the other ninety-nine percent? 
Um, so that's really where we try to serve is that 99% is you know, they still deserve to have access to uh, the tools to unlock their royalties. And, and, you know, other than on SoundCloud, where do you find these people? Um, well, they actually find us. Um, uh, too much, we haven't spent the dollar in marketing in over a year and a half. Um, and we have clients from 40 countries. Uh, we have artists in Turkey who all they do is do arrangements. Um, and we have, you know, bedroom producers in Australia who want to administer their own rights in the United States. Um, so there's artists and songwriters, not only in the United States, because MLC is not, you know, a U.S. only organization. It's the U.S. represent, you know, U.S. administrator in the U.S., but representing, obviously, songwriters from around the world. And, and you know, I think everyone that's been on the panel I mean, and everyone that's up here have members from around the world. Um, it's not just, you know, the the Nashville songwriter, but it's also the songwriter um, in Amsterdam or the, the songwriter in, in Czech Republic or wherever. So, you know, we've been able to um, help these independent long tail songwriters in any territory administer in the United States so they can collect their performance royalties, they can collect their mechanical royalties, uh, and they can set up properly to do that until such time that they're ready to go to a publisher and then they can present to a publisher, here's my royalty statements for the last two years and I actually know my value because I've been able to collect those things as opposed to saying, okay, well I've never collected anything and the publisher is gonna go collect it and then you know, try to go back two years and try to you know, you dig through any, any unclaimed royalties. So um, they come through a number of sources and it's really, like I said, there's information out there um, we, we have blog posts, we do webinars, we do ebooks, uh, podcasts, and all this kind of informational free education stuff. There's actually someone in the audience who I actually just met today who came to us because he f read an article that, that we wrote in regards to um, sound recording versus a composition and learned about that and then signed up. And they actually, we end up learning from that person, which is in the audience that we had to fix our IPI, um, um, it was either IPI or our ISWC, we had to fix one of our fields, not because we didn't have the information correct, because, but because they were assigned from a different uh, territory and it was a little bit, little bit different. So we learn and we adjust um, as well. So I think it's, it's a really great relationship to be able to work with the DIY independent artists from all over um, and, and learn about certain nuances in their territories that ultimately affects their rights um, or their access to their rights here in the United States. Great, thank you. Saving the best for last. <laughs> so, uh, Linda, Sound Exchange is probably the closest parallel to the, to the MLC in that it was once also a new organization that had to go out and educate creators about a new collective designated by the government um, to collect and distribute the royalties. Um, can you talk about their, your experiences in reaching out to performers uh, to get them to sign up with your company and uh, how that might translate to what we're doing here. Sure. We have been um, at this for almost 20 years now and have kind of learned our lessons, thought, you know, from what works and what doesn't and what is tried and true. Um, and again, I think one benefit the MLC does have is that this has been done before. And things like, you know, government regulated uh, music uh, co-op is not such a scary term to those that have come to become familiar with the digital streaming. Remember when Sound Exchange started, you know, digital music was brand new. So you were trying to educate folks that were very used to, you know, round pieces of plastic as being the distribution method for music, that this new method was going to have to be uh, trusted. And it sounds easy, particularly because Sound Exchange, um, at its outset and still to this day, receives all of its uh, licensee information from the licensees. So every month we get a, a log from the uh, the folks that, that use the statutory 114 license and say, these are all the songs I played this month and this is the check that's commensurate with all those songs. And then we have the, the pleasure, the honor to go out and say, hi, I'm, I'm Linda and I have money for you. And you know, we have to actually track these folks down. There's um, much more familiarity today than there was you know, even 10 years ago when this started. Um, and people are generally familiar with what sound exchange is, but that didn't come easy. I mean, people definitely had to learn those lessons. Um, and 
it was interesting because you mentioned the word trust, and I wrote the word trust in, in giant capital letters here um, during some of the earlier comments. But you really have to trust the person that you're turning over your very personal information to. So whether it's you know all of the metadata for your song, or it's your your driver's license and your bank account number. I mean, all those things you know, have to be trusted. So as nice as people might think I am when I walk up to them and say, "Hi, I'm Linda. I have money for you. They're, Just give me your bank account, and can I have your license for a minute? And I'm going to copy that." And you know, there's definitely um, there was a bit of distrust. Um, what we have found over the years, and it is it is as true today as it was 20 years ago, and it will probably be this way for forever and all time, is you have to trust the person that's telling you about this new revenue stream. Um, you know, all of us can come from Washington and our, you know, fancy clothes, and we can try to talk the, 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 um, nomenclature of any area, whether it's, you know, in the different genres of music. But when it comes right down to it, if it's a buddy of yours or somebody from a band that you have played with or, you know, somebody you went to music school with, that's going to be the person that you trust. Hey, it's this thing Sound Exchange, you've really got to sign up for that. It's amazing. Those checks come every month and you know, they really are, are, are doing a lot of the work for us. Um, and so we have found that having those kind of trusted agents spread the word of, of what we're doing is really one of the most effective tools. Um, my best example of that is probably what we do every March in Austin, Texas at South by Southwest. We, uh, we run a match of all of the unclaimed money against all of the bands that are performing in Austin over the course of those two weeks. And believe it or not, there's still hundreds of bands that have not registered for Sound Exchange. The number's a lot less than it used to be. It used to be, you know, five, six, seven hundred bands. I think last year it was about 108, if I'm getting that right. But we make banners, we hang them all over Austin. Now in the age of people having, you know, cameras on their phones that, you know, their buddies are like, hey man, your name is on that banner. They say they have money for you. You better show up at the artist lounge tomorrow afternoon. And lo and behold, that's how we find people because somebody who knows them is telling them that, that, that they need to trust us. And that's really where we've had the most success. It's going to where the artists are. And I just want to expand on, on something that, that was mentioned earlier is, you know, it's not one size fits all at all. I mean, Roseanne earlier was talking about, you know, how different the music business is for her son than it was for her. Those messages have to be carefully tailored, you know, to a mother and a son and a grandson and different genres. I've just, I've been in Miami this whole week and like speaking to artists down in Miami is completely different than speaking to artists in Nashville, Tennessee mostly because a lot of them speak a completely different language uh, in Spanish. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, there's a completely different way of doing business within the industry. And that's why um, Sound Exchange has had a lot of success by, and my team is made up of, of various participants that can actually, you know, get into those communities with that trust and speak that language. Um, because what is true in LA and in New York is not gonna be true in Nashville or Miami or Austin or in other music centers. I think that's, a really key point, you know, so the, the Recording Academy is made up of 12 chapters that span the entire country. We have 22,000 members that are all actual songwriters, composers, musicians, artists, producers, engineers. So the, the peers that, the tr that we've been talking about that need to do that communication. And yeah, like our Florida chapter is very different than our San Francisco chapter. You know, Ivan, who's here, is from our Philadelphia chapter, which is very different than our our Nashville or, or our Memphis chapter. So, you know, I think finding again, that's where you get to the trust issue. Is that you know, through a network like that, you have peers talking to peers from their local community that have credibility, that have trust, and then can reach the people that haven't been reached before. And I think I think that's good. A tremendous opportunity for for us, but also a responsibility. Yeah. So go, coming back, thank you. Uh, coming back to Linda, I have a question. You know, when Sound Exchange started doing this, you know, was there a government edict? You must go out and educate and outreach for you know performers, as there is for song songwriters. Um. Definitely to make sure that this was going to work. Uh, it wasn't, I don't think, it written out as explicitly as it has been with the MLC. But absolutely, you know, we understood at the time that if we didn't get people paid, that that was just going to be, you know, a lot of services paying a lot of money into some account that was just going to sit there. So um, it took a while. If you look, we have a great chart on our website that kind of shows our payments over time. The first year we were at this, I think we paid out $20 million dollars. 
And last year we paid out almost a billion dollars. So that number has gone up, you know, quite a bit. Um, it took a long time to get people into the system. Um, it is something you know, some people in this room will be familiar with the history that you know we don't want to sit on money for too long. It's not a good day for us to have a lot of money paid in but not paid out. So not so much a government edict, but we understood that the success of the system was going to be based on on people being educated about it and trusting that when somebody says they're calling from Sound Exchange and they have money for you, that it's that it's the real deal and that they that the organization has their interests in mind, um, which is absolutely what we do. So I, I think John alluded to that on an earlier panel that it was very hard, at least initially. Um, here we have a different kind of situation where the Copyright Office is a part of this education and outreach. Does that help legitimize, you know, re outreach for uh, songwriters in the context of the DLC or the MLC? I think it does. I mean, you've got the the seal and the and the you know government and Pramata behind you. Um, that being said, a lot of people don't trust the government. A lot of people don't want the government in their business. Um, and having that that backing, I think, will help legitimize the operation. But again, you have to put the language in terms that people can understand. I'm, I was laughing, not laughing, but I was, I was noting the way one of your earlier questions was worded. You know, how do we let these people know that they have to effectively manage their metadata? I mean, I can guarantee you that no songwriter wakes up in the morning <laughs> and it's like, I have to effectively manage my metadata today. I mean, that's just not what they're thinking about when they're you know, yeah. writing their songs. So. Except for probably the three we had earlier today. So. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, there's three. You got, you, your, your, your job is started. But um, you know, it's really putting it in terms you know, that, that that Jen was saying before about the NSA, I can help you understand how to speak to these people, what is happening in those writers' rooms. You know, and the writers' rooms in Nashville look very different than, than you know, studios out in LA. So I think having the, the government there is important, but it's really um, incumbent on the Copyright Office and on all of us to make sure that the right messengers are the ones delivering, you know, the words that they, they hear. So I want to expand on that a little bit and let um, the end of our panel here talk. Kevin, you know, how do you get songwriters to trust oh boy um, I mean you have to you have to be clear-eyed about the source of the mistrust and and take it really seriously and and treat it sort of non-defensively and there's a lot of different sources some of it's like government is scary and the, the process of putting together legislation is scary and and there's a sense that a lot of the changes in the big picture business model are happening without really inviting a lot of input from creators directly and that they're driven sort of more by the needs of big big business and private equity and so like we have to take that kind of stuff seriously and then optimize for trust at every stage of the process. So optimize for trust in system design, meaning like if you're designing a portal, involve creators in the design of the portal while it's being built, not in not just in the messaging of it out afterwards, because by getting that direct feedback from them in the, at the design stage, then you know that you've got a system that, that's accessible to them and make sure that you're um, involving diverse creators from different backgrounds, working in different genres, working in uh, with different kinds of career models. Crucially, you should pay them for that work um, because even the process of entering your own metadata is generally uncompensated labor, but the process of focus group and consulting is also like labor that uh, if you don't pay them, then you get a self-selected group of people who can afford to spend the time on that kind of stuff. And so then it's not representative of the whole population that you're trying to serve. Uh, those are some of the considerations that I'd think about. Could I add just one more thing? Because I think the other point um, that we should also, or the other problem we should be solving for is also not just trust, but also how do we create the capacity to um, incentivize action and execution. And by that, I mean, it, when we have um, so many diverse and new entries into the industry, and you know, when we're talking about DIY creators, um, how is it that we are, um, and I think this is especially true in marginalized or dis disenfranchised communities, is that, you know, just we've been culturized to not necessarily understand the power and value of our creative works. And 
you know, what I see a lot is that, you know, and this is not just in this specific industry, it's in a number of industries, and we're seeing it more and more and more as the creator economy becomes a thing, right? But it's just the idea of just putting things out there and hoping something will stick and not necessarily understanding just how powerful and valuable it is. But I think if with the more and more we have those conversations, um, and I think it's to your point of just like kind of lighting that fire of, of interest and, and, you know, increasing that appetite to learn more. More. But I think the foundation really has to be at the at the core of it that this is what you're creating is is valuable and incredibly important. So let's make sure you're taking the steps um, to make sure that we're able to find you and access you and 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 that you're actually a part of this. In regards to the DIY community, I mean our industry over decades and decades has been just mushroomed by complexity, and that's creating silos to establish a legacy, right? So every silo wants to have their legacy. And when it, we're in a world now which is the complete opposite, which is self-distributed you know, creators, DIY materials and tools and services. And creators can do this by themselves. They don't need you know, multiple, multiple databases worldwide, right? They just need to put it into that stream of commerce and then have someone else push it out and radiate it, radiate it out. So I think we have to start with what is the most simple uncomplicated tool to give to a DOI creator and then let the system push it out wherever, whichever silo it has to go into. Um, what I also want to add, because you just made me think about this, is uh, I mean, there's a couple of challenges, obviously, that uh, the creators have, not only the education part, but even once they start to learn, they become overwhelmed because they start to learn that, um, well, okay, I, I now have these two copyrights because I'm the you know, singer-songwriter, so I have the sound recording and the composition, but then I also now have learned that I have these different rights that have to be registered not only with MLC, but with all the other music rights organizations in the United States, um, and that becomes more complicated because I have to go to this organization and, and create an account and register my song and then to this organization and do the same thing and then this, this, this organization and it becomes, uh, we did the math for an average um, album of 14 tracks, there's 120 individual registrations across all the rights organizations, the metadata services that power the metadata and DSPs um, and the intermediaries that handle things like mechanical licensing um, right now. So if you look at all these organizations, there's 120 registrations. So if you're an independent artist with 14 tracks on an average album, you have 120 registrations to do, and that's overwhelming, right? So you know that was part of the reason why we why you know we created Tune Registry is to go to each of these organizations and say, hey, you know you have a membership portal, but members aren't actually logging in and registering their songs, right? You have a dashboard already, but they're not actually logging in to download their statements. So how can we how, and you don't work with each other because you're siloed. So how can we work with all of you and aggregate this, which is what Tune Registry does, is one-stop shop. I create my song once in Tune Registry, and then it gets to ASCAP and BMI and CSEC and Harry Fox and Music Reports and Sound Exchange, um, and then all the metadata services under it, and then hopefully to the MLC. And it's not, and we're not in a place to replace any of those organizations. We're simply a conduit. How can we deliver? We always say we're kind of like the Gmail of music rights. We want to be able to deliver the registration in the proper format in a timely manner. And also we help the artists understand each of the fields that they're required to complete, to understand um, you know, the splits and kind of get involved with some of the you know, conflict resolutions and things like that. So a lot of artists have learned um, about you know, their IPI numbers and ISWCs and ISRCs and, and various uh, codes as a result of, of, of our platform and then being able to administer on both sides the copyrights in one place. So it's not only the challenge of how do we reach them and then educate them, but then how do we as an industry simplify? Because we're becoming more fragmented. With every new organization, that's a new place they have to join and manage, another account, another relationship. Um, I always use this example of, you know, we started with, with ASCAP in 1914, and then with you know BMI and and CSAC in the 30s, and then we introduced with Harry Fox Agency, and then we introduced Sound Exchange, and we introduced Music Reports as an uh, administrator uh, uh, on behalf of the DSPs, but also rep working in between rights holders, and now we introduced in the you know, in the last several years GMR, and and now we're introducing MLC. So it's like we're actually making it more fragmented, more complicated and therefore creating more of a challenge for someone who's already overwhelmed. Um, so how do these organizations simplify? And that means working with the startups 
that are trying to help simplify on behalf of the writers, um, independent, the DIYs. And I know we're talking about DIYs, but we don't, also, we don't only work with DIYs. We have quote unquote legacy songwriters, songwriters who had hits in the 70s, songwriters who had hits in the 80s, who are out of their label contract or in, uh, out of their publishing contract or about to be out of their publishing contract, who are now representing themselves and don't know how to do this because the industry had always been, you know, the publisher did all the work, you did nothing but wrote your songs, and that was great, that's how it worked in the 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s, but now those same songwriters are starting to get their copyrights back. And some of them want to keep their copyrights if they don't renegotiate, and they become a part of the long tail as well, uh, but they still have their hits from the 80s and 90s um, or, se or, or 70s. Um, so, we're use so we're seeing those type of clients as well and trying to help them understand, okay, well now you're responsible for this copyright. There's no organization, you know, you've, you're out of your publishing contract and no one's gonna do it. So they need to know to come to the MLC and to create an account and to register songs. And they had never done it before, not with their PRO because their, their publisher had done it for, for decades. So that's another, that's a whole different conversation with a whole different group that's also not tech savvy. These, you know, they're not tech savvy like the younger DIY artists might be, tech savvy and they just need to learn how to use a tool and to log in. But you talk to someone who all they did was, you know, they wrote lyrics and they, and they, they worked in a studio and they handed paper to a, a, a representative at a publisher in the 70s and that was all they, all they did. And now they have an online portal. <laughs> you know, now we have 12 right. online portals. I, I think the inputs is actually the easiest thing to solve, it, particularly at the time of creation, because that's, I mean, you don't want to up, root the, the creative process, because when people are in the creative mind, they don't want to deal with metadata, so it might be before or after. I think the interoperability, we've basically DRM'd our metadata with all the different silos in the world by design. That's how copyright is, has been structured. That's what needs to be really fixed. The input's actually, I think, the easiest part. Well, let me, let me ask the panel this. Um, you know, we've talked about the strength of word of mouth. We've talked about artists in, in some ways, uh, having the monetary incentive to go find the people they need to talk to. If these are the trees, how do we plant the seeds? I think we heard about South by Southwest, recording the academies, different chapters, different organizations. What else can you know, we as a community do to reach out even if understanding that different groups accept messages in different ways? You know, is it appearing at conferences? Is it uh, digital, is it uh, handouts, is it um, schools for music business? You know, what other kind of ways can we plant these seeds, I think is the question. Well, it's all of the above, right? Mm -hmm. But I, I think w one thing I wanted to touch on real quick, just on, on that building trust aspect and, and validating that this is legitimate. I think one thing I observed with Sound Exchange is that seeing that it actually works and is paying money is one is going to be the best way to get songwriters trust to see that it is actually doing what it's supposed to do because I think with sound exchange once an artist starts getting that check and then they talk about it and like I had no idea this is incredible I'm getting like <laughs> free money in the mail but even though it's it's not free but they, this check that they didn't know they were supposed to be getting well then they become an evangelist and a validator for sound exchange that goes to other artists and says you really need to sign up for this because like I didn't I didn't know and now I'm getting these checks and it's awesome and you need to do this too. And I think that's one of the, the, the big successes of Sound Exchange. So I, I think the same thing that potential is there for the MLC is is at least in the early days, you know, the songwriters that are in the system that are getting paid, then evangelize to others that don't know about it and say, this is like, you're going to get a check. I, like, I, here's mine. You need to do this too. I, I think that's going to be a really important piece of this. But to the first question, I think do all of those things. Like, you know, don't, don't pick and choose. Be where the songwriters are. Be where the music community is. Be where the, the representatives and the managers and the lawyers, where, where all of it is. I mean, you know, whether it's South by Southwest, where it's Music Biz, ASCAP Expo, you know, all of those places and, you know, all the communities where, where music makers are. One area we've had a lot of success in getting a lot of those messages and those e evangelical comments is just finding people right after they get their check for the first time. Um, whether, you know, it's, it's, you know, getting on the phone with them or being in a place with them in person. I have a person on my team that all year long will save all of those testimonials, whether they come in by email or on the phone. And then, um, 
at the end of the year, we kind of have a rolling, um, you know, highlight reel of, you know, this one said this, or this one used their sound exchange check to, you know, get a new van or put new strings on their guitar or, you know, whatever anecdotal information that they have. I mean, some people will, you know, buy a third mansion and some people will get a new pair of sneakers for their kid. Um, but just sharing those messages from those artists is just so much more powerful than really anything that the government or any company or organization can say. But, you know, to, ha to be able to have an artist say, that an artist say to me um, earlier this year, you know, oh, thank you so much, Sound Exchange. You know, you gave my family Christmas last year. Like that's really powerful. And you know, to have other artists and songwriters hear that, that should invoke a lot of that trust. Yeah, I think ambassadors in general is really important too. I mean, we live in an age where influencers are everything, you know, especially to the newer generation that are a lot of this long tail that we have a hard time getting to join and getting our arms around. Um, you know, they all look up to somebody in this industry. And so to have those people out there too, saying this is a legitimate thing, like you probably have money out here is huge. I will say though, I, you know, we heard a little bit earlier and I'm not um, trying to say anything that in the aggregate, that the checks coming from the MLC will not be substantial, but relatively sound has changed. Their payouts are uh, very large and, uh, in the last year, how much money did Sound Exchange give out? Well, an aggregate, a billion dollars, right. uh, almost, um, just shy of that. But I work in these accounts every single day, and I see what some of these numbers are. Um, you know, Mark, you can adjust this too. Not all of them are, you know, huge influences. These are, you know, checks for you know thirty, forty, fifty dollars. Um, you know, our threshold is anything over ten. Um, there's some people that don't even meet that threshold. You know, I have to tell them, I'm sorry, you're only, you know, eight dollars. So it, there is a long tail, and and these organizations are going to have to figure out a way to deal with that. Um, but it's, you know, so it's keeping those messages in check and not coming out with the, you know, the six figure numbers and the seven figure numbers all the time, I think will, will appeal to everybody to take part in the system. What about the other um, kind of inducement, the, the credit, the cultural satisfaction of seeing your name associated with your work? Uh, I think, Todd, you had mentioned before uh, that you cannot be eligible for the Grammys unless your information is out there. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, one, to be a, a member of the Academy, you have to have demonstrable credits on, you know, released work. But, you know, if you want to be nominated or recognized for your work, you have to be associated with that work as whether the songwriter or any other musical participant. If we don't know that you're the one that did it, we, we can't, you know, you're not going to get nominated for it. So uh, I, I think having reliable credits, uh, like I said, you know, even from a historical cultural perspective, like knowing who worked on a track, you know, when it was recorded, what studio it was made in. I mean, all of that stuff has significance. Um, and, you know, again, I think from a fan perspective, if you think 20 or 30 years ago, people used to sit and look at liner notes and, and see, you know, who, who worked on their favorite song and then go find other stuff that those people did and it encouraged music discovery, um, which again has a long tail that benefits music creators when people go out and seek more music uh, related to the, the people that they like. Um, you know, we did an initiative last month where um, big artists, you know, posted on their social media accounts using their social media platform all the credits for some of their, their most popular works to give credit to the people that often go unrecognized. You know, that's an initiative we're going to do every year. And so, but again, an example of using every tool in the toolbox, right, to get to educate people to get the information out. So social media platforms from big celebrities, from famous artists, is one tool in the toolbox for, for educating people. Um, but you use, you use every tool. Yeah, I, I think we've heard uh, earlier, maybe for all the efforts we could do today, one tweet for, for, from Pharrell will <laughs> go a long way. <laughs> it doesn't hurt. I mean, it doesn't. And, and that's something, you know, like you, right now we're in voting season for the Academy. And so, you know, how do we communicate to our members the importance of voting um, for the, the awards? And again, we use every tool in the toolbox. We're using emails. We're using social media. We're using, uh, you know, maybe text messaging and, and just all those different things. So it's finding the right special mix. When you talked about validation, I mean, there's plenty of these writers and artists out there who a $10 check associated with their song, 
means as much as a $10,000 check because it's validation that they are an income earning songwriter. Are there, are there anyone out there, maybe they're doing a favor for a friend and, and writing a riff for a song, or maybe they're a ghostwriter where they don't want credit? Does that happen? Well, uh, as far as don't want credit, I don't know if it's necessarily um, don't want credit, but rather um, the reason why they're doing music is passion and they haven't quite got to the business part yet. Um, and we see a lot of that. Um, when we have collaborators, especially in EDM music. Uh, so we have international EDM artists who are working with, you know, small 18, 19, 20 year old um, creators all over Europe. And they're just, they're just not subscribed to the music industry as a business. As this is a, something that's cool. They love Diplo and they love, you know, Marshmallow and they want to create their own sounds and they just started learning to produce and they want to put it out there because they can put it on SoundCloud in a matter of seconds, but they can also get it onto Spotify via DistroKid or CD Baby and they just haven't got around to what credit even means. Um, so, but they might collaborate with someone who actually is involved in that. Um, and they go to register stuff and then they realize, oh wait, I need to have this other person information because you know, I'm going to register it. So we, I think there's, there's, um, there's a class of creators that just haven't quite got, um, you know, into what the business is uh, around the music and credit isn't what they're really seeking. They, they want exposure. Um, and the idea of credit is not even, at, uh, um, it's related obviously because exposure means you're, you're getting recognized, but they don't see it as like the term credit. Right, they don't see it as I'm getting credit for this. It's, it's I want exposure. I want people to hear this cool mix that I did or this is you know, the song that I did. And I think I mean, so it's funny just to kind of like piggyback on that point. So in the the clinics that we host, I would say about 80 percent of the folks that come and sit down. So what we do is we let them sit down with intellectual property attorneys for about 30 minutes and they can talk, talk to them about whatever they want. And one of the things that we see after we like kind of take a tally of everything that happened is that a lot of times, um, you know, creators like to create and they like to collaborate. And the, the business side of the conversation comes afterwards, if at all. And a lot of times what we were seeing is, is that one person, um, you know, it, it's when money comes in and when something kind of pops off in some way, be it from followship or, you know, something else. But that's when these questions um, of credit start to come in where they weren't discussed in the beginning. And so there's confusion around that. Um, but it's usually something that kind of triggers it. Because uh, again, it's, it's, it's a very collaborative and creative uh, community that, you know, that's the, the side of it that they enjoy. You know, I think that you, uh, the Copyright Office came to one of your events, which was very enlightening. Uh, I'm interested to, you know, Maybe talk me through a little bit of how you put those together, how you decide to uh, reach out to different people to invite them to come, um, who you get to speak, um, who you get as the attorneys, just the process of an event like that. Sure. Um, so, you know, what we do is that we basically find communities, basically com communities of color that are in, you know, centers. We're really big on going to where folks are. Um, and we are really intentional about um, creating very creative spaces. Because, again, you know, our whole core and what we try to start at the foundation is we need to make sure sh folks understand what intellectual property is. We need to make sure they understand the value of it. And we need to make sure they understand what it means to be able to share, protect, and monetize your creative works, right? So that is the spirit that we come into it. Um, we build a brain, brain trust in that city um, from word of mouth. I mean, it is, um, it, it's really sensational how these communities, you know, just like you said, everybody knows everybody, right? And you can quickly figure out who it is that you need to get on board and that they will then suddenly start bringing in this amazing community of other creatives. So one example would be um, our, a mutual friend is Hollis and literally opened the door. I mean, she introduced me to some of the most phenomenal creative folks in, um, in the creative community in LA. And we were able to, we did our event in um, Nipsey Hussle's um, incubator, right? So we had, then what we do is we partner with local firms, um, you know, Loeb and Loeb, 
Globe, Aaron Fox. We had some fantastic firms. And you guys, I want you to understand, we had these firms come to Crenshaw and re reach out to the community. I mean, it was fantastic. And it's just, it was this super creative space. And what we did was we create panels that are um, a beautiful integration of both policy-minded, legal-minded, and creative-minded folks having conversations. Um, and, you know, that question when, that moment when all of a sudden we start using our wonky talk and the person next to you who's more creative is like, wait, 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 what did you just say? And, you know, just creating those moments where folks can kind of break things down and talk about things in ways that really resonate with the different communities that, we were, that we're trying to reach. And so it looks different in L.A. than it does in Miami. It looks different in D.C. and it looks different in NYC because everybody wants to talk about these issues in different ways. Um, but for me and, for, you know, what we've seen to be most successful is to really partner with folks early on um, and just so that it's it's baked in. I it, it, To me, it, it, we always, I have fallen on my face when I try to just create this master plan and then just do the same exact thing in every space. It, it just has not worked for me. Um, but when you really create those organic and authentic spaces that are both creative and then integrated with these more substantive conversations, um, folks have an appetite for it. And I think that you'll also see, I mean, you know, to the point earlier about going to South by Southwest, and you'll see like a lot of these festivals, they're actually having additional days tagged on to them for actual substantive conversations, right? Like there's a creative appetite that, 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 that's developing where folks do want to have these conversations. And so, you know, just going a little further off the beaten path. I mean, I think the South by Southwest, like that's a, that's a fantastic place to start, right? Um, and just being willing to kind of show up in these places and participate. How does that, is there anything you want to say about your different uh, districts in terms of the Recording Academy and how you get people to your events? Sure. I mean, I, I, so we, uh, again, just kind of what's already been said, I mean, we tailor it each because each chapter is so unique and because they're run uh, by the people that are there, by our, our members that are local, you know, they key into what's interesting uh, to their local communities. And, and so whether, you know, we're putting together a workshop or, um, you know, other kind of showcase event where we bring people together, you know, in a local studio space or, uh, you know, but it is going to be something that's tailored to that community. And, and so, you know, I know we certainly intend to do that with all of our chapters and, and some of our chapters even within the chapter are diverse. You know, our Chicago chapter covers the whole Midwest, so they also reach Detroit, they reach Minneapolis and those diverse communities. And our, our Memphis chapter includes uh, the whole Mississippi Delta and, and New Orleans and Louisiana. And, and so, you know, we tailor events throughout those communities to reach the people that are there and their unique needs. Our um, Pacific Northwest is in Seattle, but they include uh, Hawaii. I'm definitely pushing to do that workshop <laughs> if we can get there. But uh, but there is like a rich music community in, in Hawaii that um, is very active, and and so you know using that apparatus to reach to every place uh, where where there's people making music. It's true. Senator Hirono asked the Copyright Office a question about uh, small creators at the last hearing, so I I believe it. Um, for for Kevin and Linda. Let's talk not about in-person events for a second. Web presence, um, digital outreach. What lessons learned can you share with us? What is what is successful? Um, it's interesting when I interview interns to come in and, and other folks to come work at the department, I ask them how they are at internet stalking because we do a fair amount of that. No, um, And it's interesting, as much as you think that you know people should be getting up and thinking about how to manage their metadata and how they um, you know, can be making money. A lot of creators just haven't gotten there yet. So we use a lot of social media. We use a lot of you know, um, Instagram, Facebook. We will uh, subscribe to different services about um, you know, whether we have people who have agents. Um, we do just a lot of like news searches, you know, we watch the charts, we see who's on the chart, and then we try to, you know, find that person even before they have their first dime pay into the system so that we know where they are and we know and get them in, you know, into the umbrella. So when that first um, service reports that they're playing a song, if it's on the chart, um, you know, a hit seekers, we look at that all the time. These are folks nobody's ever heard of, but, you know, Billie Eilish was on that list about five years ago, and now here we are. So, you know, we really try to, um, to use all the resources we 
can. And if whether it's you know an intern in, in our office in DC or um, we actually now have regional reps in cities all over the country that will report back in, hey, I heard this band out. They had you know 30 people there, but they sound great. You know, that's kind of these little mini A and R um, chapters around the country that will will get us aware of who may be having money come through our system for them. There's not really one specific way of doing it. It's kind of like when you said before, it's all of the above. Um, but technology certainly has made that easier. I do think the MLC is better situated to do that here in, in 2019 than Sound Exchange was you know, almost 20 years ago. We just didn't have those tools available to us then. I just want to add to that. So um, I mean, prior to uh, Tune Street being acquired by Jamber, uh, we didn't really spend, like I said, any much money on marketing. I mean, we did appearances at uh, conferences, but that was mostly me as a speaker. Um, so 90% of our uh, songwriters and small mom and pop publishers have come through all of our digital efforts, which is mostly focused on content marketing. Um, very important, very targeted, uh, very timely articles. Um, for example, you know how to release a cover song uh, legally, and that. Google search keeps pushing, you know, people keep coming through that article. Um, Ebooks, um, webinars that are also very kind of specific, um, you know, how to monetize your YouTube and collect royalties on that. So things that are kind of, uh, um, that are interesting to the target audience um, and that can be, you know, that can be disseminated digitally so that there, you know, it's not much cost. So most of it has been, um, creating content and that content basically being available 24 seven online and having uh, traffic come through that content in, diff in different formats. And I would say SoundCloud, I mean, sorry, uh, SoundExchange um, does also a really great job in terms of your digital, uh, social media specifically. I really like the social media um, and, the e -new and the newsletter, I'm, I get it. <laughs> so the That's newsletter great. is really great. The email newsletter coming through, is, it's always uh, pretty updated. Um, with information and featuring different sound exchange uh, members, and so I think that's you know that's the most easy and effective and cheapest uh, route in, in, as far as doing events in different cities as well. And, and I'll just say also, I, th I think there is a real hunger in the creator community to get this information. You know, when when the MMA passed, we saw just a tremendous amount of engagement from songwriters and artists to pass the Music Modernization Act. And they all knew it was something that was important that was going to help them. And they're like, yes, I'm, I'm going to do my part, whether it's you know, making phone calls, writing emails, purchasing billboards in some cases. Um, but then once it got passed, a lot of people are asking, OK, so now what? It passed. What's supposed to happen? Wasn't isn't something supposed to happen? And they want to know what's next and what that information is. And, you know, we we hosted a town hall in Chicago earlier this year. Sound Exchange was there, and it was standing room only. I mean, it was packed. Um, you know, with over 200 people there because, and it was just an educational session on on what the MMA does and and what it's going to do. And and people want that information. So I I think if we do make it accessible and make it easier for them to get it, it's going to be received. Right, and that's what I remember from that. And somebody earlier today had said, you need to tell them what it is, but also how to do it. And I think that is something in the education, we really need to be very clear on kind of how to do this. And Todd, I'm sure you've gotten the same questions. I remember right after the MMA passed, I had a producer ask me, so does the check show up next month? Or the, right. is it, and I'm like, it just doesn't show up out of the air. You have to do something, you know? So it, you have to be very clear about how they can participate, because they want to, but you know, it's, it, this is what it is, and this is how you get into the system. Well, and I would say that while it's incredibly important for the MLC to have a really professional looking, easy to use website and social media accounts and everything, it is as important, if not more, to have partners like SoundCloud and Tune Registry so that we go to where these people are. I mean, we can't expect them to just show up at our front door. We've got to go out and knock on their front door, and this is where they live. So, That's a great point. I actually just thought about what we did um, with Harry Fox, actually. I, we did an article. Um, for the longest time, um, you know, DIY artists would come to us and say, you know, we're not getting – I don't know what royalties collect. And once I learned about royalties from Spotify, I learned that I have a mechanical royalty, but I can't sign up for Harry Fox and I don't have a publisher. And that was misinformation. I mean, for the longest time, for years, uh, you could create an online account. So what I did was we just basically created a blog post 
and went through each field of the registration form and explained each individual field. We started with a little kind of an opening introduction uh, paragraph about collecting royalties, you know, mechanical royalties from your Spotify streams as well as Apple Music and other services, and then went through each individual field and then sent that article to John, who then proofread it, sent back notes, and then we published that and sent the email out, and we've had now dozens, if not hundreds, of artists. I mean, every single month, we're now registering hundreds of songs um, to HFA uh, on behalf of uh, these DIY songwriters who previously thought they needed a publisher to be able to do that. And we started getting emails. I remember our first one is Luke Rathborn. I'm only saying his name because he's already let us use this information. But he had you know, millions of Spotify streams and never collected any mechanical royalties and then joined us, um, created an account, and started getting his checks February this year for the first time and sent me emails with screenshots. Of, oh my God, I'm getting you know, checks from Spotify. I never knew that. So that is going to happen with, with artists uh, signing up with MLC. Is, but we need to have these you know, resources and, you know, communities, online communities like, you know, SoundCloud and, and us who already have an aggregate uh, of, of songwriters and artists. But that's a great example. I want to point out something helpful that SoundExchange does too, which is that they employ musicians. So if you call up the customer service line, odds are pretty good that you're going to get a musician from here in the local DC scene um, as, as your customer service rep. And that's just really helpful because it means that they understand the vocabulary and they're easy to communicate with. Uh, for me, I mean, musicians are diverse. You might not, it, we, different kinds of musicians might have different experiences, but I think it, it would be similarly a good idea in setting up a new system, you know, rather than setting up like a, a call center of people who don't have experience in as you know, working in music to, to try and hire from a pool of people who have some direct investment um, to, be, to be shepherding people through this process. That's very true. I sit right outside the call center and I hear them all day long saying, you know, well, they, they just understand the process, the, the how to do the fields. And, and it's actually, it's a wonderful place to work. Thank you for the compliment. Um, this time of year, you're tripping over everybody's instruments in the hallway because they all are gigging out at night. And it's, um, but that's very true. They can really speak from the heart and they've gone through the process themselves in many cases. And I would say for someone who can completely relate to, so we are constantly trying to create opportunities to talk about intellectual property. And one of the things that we are always looking for are pop culture teachable moments. So when you have Chance the Rapper um, doing an interview and then suddenly he just goes off and talks about how complicated copyright law is, right? Well, there is our teachable moment. Yeah. And we swipe in and we try to do cute little social media and things like that. And it's just to say, um, or when Cardi B is on a billboard and they're talking about, yeah, it's a picture of her and it, it, what's going on with your intellectual property, just little random moments that you know have somehow pierced the, the consciousness of, of pop culture and then just turning that into a teachable moment, um, you know, I, I think is an extremely effective way too. And uh, Mark, I wanted to give you a, an opportunity to respond about the suggestion that, you know, it's very important and to partner services and creators and that value. I'm sure it's a point of pride to hear that these very successful ar artists started out on your service. Yeah, no, I mean, SoundCloud, we want to give tools and, 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 and services to our creators to be successful. So, like I said before, a lot of creators start out as hobbyists, and that, that they're putting their works into the, the kind of the stream of, of commerce, not thinking it's commerce. Then ultim ultimately it becomes a hit, and then they're chasing their tail. And so we're trying to educate them just as much about SoundCloud as a, as a platform, but about the intellectual property that's underneath it as well. Well, that's great. I think we're uh, running a little low on time. Why don't we uh, just go through and see if anybody has any final thoughts on educating creators? Well, um, again, I would just say making sure, I mean, to your point earlier, um, that the messaging, so, so I'm an educator. I teach at UCLA, and I know that I write very technical. And I've had even my co-founders who were our lawyers tell me like, okay, that's way too, <laughs> that was way too that's way too technical. You need, we need to kind of scale this, that language back in terms of making it palatable. And once we've started doing that and started hearing from artists saying, oh, I've you know learned more about you know this because of that article or that ebook, um, 
So I think the messaging, the wording, you know, like you said, we're not going to say I want to manage my metadata effectively, <laughs> right? So I would write that. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah, so I think making the copyright, I mean, you're the copyright office, but making sure there's a copywriter who can write to that audience, um, not only to, again, kind of back to my point earlier, not only to U.S. artists, but the fact that there's international. Um, we, we get inquiries to come into our inbox in multiple languages, and unfortunately, we only do support in English um, at Tune Registry, but Jamber uh, um, has multiple languages. Um, but we, we, you know, we have people come in and say, hey, like, you know, we want to do this. One of, our, our, one of our biggest clients is in Dominican Republic, and they've put out, they've registered thousands of Spanish language um, tracks through our system into the U.S. Uh, um, rights organizations. So making sure that we have multi-language um, support, making sure that the, the the messaging is at a at a level that they understand, that it's uh, that it's easy to to kind of you know swallow. Yeah, I would just say for the academy, you know, we're we're excited about the opportunity and ready to do our part. And I, and again, I think it's on on two fronts. I think uh, one once the portal is established, of of getting that out to songwriters, but also on the front end, getting those credits and data there at the very beginning so that you don't have to deal with the unclaimed royalties later on in the chain. And so I, I think focusing on, on both of those issues um, is a key to success. Um, there's a phrase that comes, I think, from the disability justice movement, but it's broadly applicable. Um, nothing about us without us, uh, just involving creators in the process um, at every stage. And, and I think in terms of creating educational materials, you can have fun with it. Let's hire a bunch of songwriters to write songs about entering their metadata in. Um, in puppet shows. In puppet shows. <laughs> no. Pharrell would do it. He's like, no. <laughs> I would say we're gonna do more puppets. <laughs> <laughs> puppets out. Um, I would say uh, keep showing up. I with our event in the copyright office, like having representatives there, we had great feedback from that. Folks really appreciated it. It made it kind of remove this veil and this uh, cloud of mystery from you know, like I know there's an office out there. I know that stuff happens, but to actually have you guys in the community um, and in these spaces is really valuable. And then, I mean, I have to tell you, um, one conversation that happened as a result uh, with one of the folks that were there is that uh, a, a creative that was there pointed out they're like, well, do you have any of these materials in Spanish? And you know, they didn't have any there. But sure enough, they st and I was on the email thread. They stayed in contact with each other. And you know, she just called me and was telling me, oh, you know, I got my box from the um, copyright office. I have an event next week, and I'm going to be sharing it with everyone. So it's just, um, I think when you show up in the community, it, it really does um, create this feeling of, of access and making things a little more um, tangible. Appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, I would just say we have to we have to really keep up our appetite to educate. I think there's a real appetite right now to educate, and I think that will continue through January 1, 2021. But, it, I mean, it is bound to start to waver some, and it's going to be really necessary to continue education at this same level for several years to really establish the MLC. Well, I'll take the opportunity to say the last word here. Uh, thank you all for coming. I, I totally believe you, Todd, when you said you had standing room only. We set the number of chairs in this room as the same number for the 512 hearing, and we had to add 20. So there's a great interest in music, uh, education, data, and everything we talked about today. Appreciate you all coming here. Uh, we will do the audience participation portion next. So if people are interested in doing that and, and have signed up, please come to the right of the stage. And thank you all very much one more time. Thanks, Doc.